So, Mary Beth and I leave Abilene about somewhere between 6.15, 6.30ish, drive over. It's foggy today, and I was singing happy birthday to her. Uh, but as we get to the building, well, actually, we stop every time at uh, exit 406 on the west side of Abilene. I mean, the west side of Weatherford. And uh, that's how long I can last before I got to go to the bathroom. And uh, so we stop there and we drive in. Today, uh, we, we start listening to praise music. And as we're driving the last five minutes, the song, we listen to the song, So Will I. And uh, what a great song. And I told Mary Beth, I said, we should have done this last week. <laughs> should have done this song last week. But I remember the first time I heard the song here, uh, Michael Rhodes did it as a communion thought in, I think, the spring of 2018. I'm not sure. But uh, since then, it's just been really a powerful song. And I, I think it's a great song. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a kind of get up and go morning song. So rather than listen to the news, you know, this, we ought to listen to this song because it's really... Uh, a song that sends me out, and I'm saying to God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what you have done. I'm going to be who you have destined me to be, uh, like the rest of creation. And so it's in that theme today that we're going to talk about creation again. We are in a study of uh, Genesis called In the Beginning, and uh, this is our third week on chapters 1 and 2. Next week, Jeremy's going to lead us into chapter three. So, woohoo, we're making some, getting some momentum going there. Uh, we talked about God's sovereign power. Uh, we talked about the beauty and goodness of creation. And today, we're going to talk about being made in God's image. So, uh, here we go. Let's, let's go at it. First of all, just a little bit of context. We're in the Torah, which means uh, sometimes it would be mistranslated, I think, law. There's a rumbling. Oh, I thought, I thought, man, it was going to be an earthquake right here in, in Arlington. Crazy. So, uh, but, but really, it's more like the instructions, the instructions. It's telling us the way to go. And the Torah is the, are these stories. And from the stories, we learn how to live. It's not a list of rules, even though some of the story includes some rules. But it's a, 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 li it's a group of stories that teach us how to live. And so in, in 2 Timothy 3, it talks about how we have been thoroughly equipped by the Scripture. So if Paul's writing this to Timothy, what Scripture is he talking about? What is it, church? Paul's writing to Timothy, and he, he uses he said, Scripture equips you. When he says Scripture, what does he mean? The yeah, the Torah or the Old Testament being also a good, good, good one as well. But uh, here, here's where I want to ask this question. Where does this come from? Where does this teaching, where do the instructions come from? Well, 2 Peter uh, says it like this, that no scripture, no prophecy in scripture came down from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. It wasn't Isaiah's ideas alone that caused him to write Isaiah. It wasn't Moses' ideas alone who caused him to write, you know, Genesis and Exodus. It, it wasn't Micah's idea. It was God. And, and so the way it happened is first they told stories. And, and this story of Genesis was told, passed on from generation to generation to generation. And, and as the story goes, a lot of times, sometimes when you're telling your family stories, uh, things get confused, right? So... Uh, and maybe you're telling it different four generations from now. But we're trusting the Holy Spirit was leading this story till finally they wrote it down. And they wrote it down. And then a lot of kids and, and who grew up to be adults, they would memorize this thing. And so for generations, they, they would memorize these scriptures. But, but again, who's the source? Well, the way uh, 2 Peter tells it, it says, no, it wasn't the prophets, but it was the prophets who were... The Bible says, moved by the Holy Spirit. And they spoke from God. So we're listening to God's 
story here. Uh, it was God's story that, that we're examining today. And today, we're going to examine this conversation that led to the existence of you and me. Why are you here? Well, there was a conversation uh, recorded in Genesis 1, and I would have loved to have been uh, a fly on the wall at this moment. I don't know. You know, when I was growing up, the old men would gather at Dairy and they would tell stories, and they'd sit around the table, drink coffee, and uh, maybe not that old, you know. Well, now people, that happens at coffee shops. Or maybe it was the family, but God, I believe God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, someone. God says in Genesis 1, let us, who is this us? I'm not sure. But let us. Let us make humans in our image. It right. He almost. Go <laughs> day. It means the image of God. posse is sitting around the table and saying let's make let's make them like us Humanity was created as rational, gifted with free will. We can, we can figure things out, we use reason, and then we make choices. And this is a reflection of God's intellect and His freedom. God also can make free choices. And so anytime someone invents a machine or writes a book or paints a landscape or invents basketball, Our creation. 
Lord of the Rings, yeah, yeah, and C.S. Lewis, they're together, they're teachers in Oxford together. And every day, you know where they'd go after work? They'd go to a pub. Not the Dairy Queen, they'd go to a pub. And they'd have a pint, as they would say. And they'd discuss things. At this time, C.S. Lewis was an atheist. But Tolkien was a very faithful uh, Catholic. And they're talking about, does God exist? Well, what kind of won Lewis over was the idea that people everywhere know that there's a right and a wrong, and especially when it comes to murder. That people who've never heard of any teaching from the Bible would know there's right and there's wrong. And this idea of a moral compass. So when anyone writes a law, or when anyone recoils from evil, or you know, you see something wrong, you know, oh, you kind of say, no, not that. Or, or the, you praise uh, good behavior, or you feel guilty even, when you feel guilty. This is confirming the fact that humans are made in the image of God. And, and then socially, uh, we're made from a triune God. God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, they loved each other. It says before the creation was, before the creation, they loved each other. And, and so like God, we're relational beings as well. So anytime someone gets married or makes a friend or hugs a child or attends church, we're, we're made to be together. We're made for each other. So being made in God's image also means we have authority and responsibility like God. So again, in our text... Uh, Genesis, we're, we're, at, we're watching the God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit discuss this creating man. So it starts out, it says in Genesis 127, 126, God said, let's make humans in our own image. And then it says, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the wild animals, and over all the creatures. He put us in a position he gave us authority and responsibility to rule. We're in charge. Human beings are in charge. And, and the idea of being in charge continues. So into uh, Psalm 8, and there's several other places we could go, that, but I, I like the way Psalm 8 does it best. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. That's how it starts out. Then jump down to verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what are mo mere mortals? What are human beings that you would think about them? You're so awesome. You've done all this. Why would you even consider us worthy of your thoughts? And then he says, But you have made them a little lower than the heavenly angels. And you've crowned them with glory and honor. And you made them, human beings, you made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. This idea that we are in charge. That we are, have a responsibility to take care of the earth. And we've been given the tools to do that. And, and I'm going to get to that idea about tools in a minute in our assignment. But this is one of the things that being made in the image of God is that we have certain abilities to use to rule over the rest of the earth. Now, there's another thing about this uh, being made in the image of God. Remember I asked you at the very beginning, I, well, maybe I didn't, but I meant to ask uh, uh, this question. What does family resemblance mean? Do you know what the term family resemblance? Think about that. Okay, family resemblance. Uh, more and more, people will see me and my boys together and almost always go, oh, did y'all know? Yeah, we know. <laughs> we, we know. We look alike. But let me ask you, who in your family do you look most like? I want you to pop them out. Who do you look most like in your family? Aunt Joe. Aunt Joe? Between your mom and dad, did you, who'd you say, Steve? Yeah, your dad. Your dad. Come on, keep coming. Your, your mom. 
It didn't look like either one of them. Well, you know. <laughs> and, and, yes, yes. But, but who, do, who are you most like in personality or in the way you behave? Your dad? You're like your dad? Yeah? Yeah, you're like your dad? Yeah, I can. So many times people have said to me, yeah, that's something your dad would have said. And I'm thinking, oh man, is that a compliment? Is that a good thing? But yeah, that's, and I always feel good, you know, when someone says, hey, you remind me of your dad. That's a great, great compliment to me. But sometimes, you know, you ask yourself the question and you don't mean it as a compliment. Am I becoming like my parents? Have you ever said things that, you know, wow, that's what dad, I, don't, I said I would never say that, but here I am saying it, right? Because you're like them. You're like them. But in a, in a way that's more important than our physical appearance, a way that's more important than our physical appearance, because really we don't really know what God looks like. And so I don't believe that's what he meant when he said he's going to make you in your, his own image. Even though I do think God is bald. <laughs> but I don't think that's what he meant here in Genesis 1. What I believe he's talking about are some other things. Number one is that we represent him. We represent God. And, and so when I was at ACU, several jobs, and one of them, after my first coaching stint, the next thing I did, I was assistant to the president. I wasn't a vice president, and on the org chart, you know, there was the president, then there's VPs, then there's deans, and, there's, and then somewhere off in a dotted line, you know, um, on the third page is me, assistant to the president. But I came to his office every day. I carried his bags most of the time. I drove his car. One day he sent me to fill, fill up his car with gas, and I, he saw that I didn't like I thought, eh, that's kind of a... He said, never mind. I'll tell you what. I'm getting ready to call a guy and ask him for a million dollars. I'll go fill up the car. You, you make the phone call. I said, no, I'll fill up the car. Not a problem. But sometimes he would send me to represent him. And often that's at a meeting he didn't want to go to or that he had other things to do. And when he did send me to, to represent him, he would give me instructions. And when I came into the room, even though I was with people who had a higher uh, job position than I did, I represented the president. And what I said, that was the way it's going to go. He can't, I would often... Dr. Teague says, this is what we're going to do. And they would always say, well, yes or no. They always say, okay, yes, we will. Because I represented him. The way 2 Corinthians, Paul says it in 2 Corinthians, he says, we are God's ambassadors. That's what an ambassador does. We, we represent the one who sent us. We're made in God's image in, in some ways to represent him. And, and it's just like... Do we look like him? And when I say, do we look like him, uh, what does that look like? Well, I think it looks just like you because we act like him. So what does that mean when I say we're made, in, what does it look like to be made in the image of God? What does that look like? Well, I would say it looks like, uh, well, it looks like Cindy. It looks like Cindy going to work. And, and when Cindy goes to work, just knowing what she does and who she's with, I know that when Cindy goes to work, God has shown up at the workplace. Because she's about justice. And she's about love. And she's about forgiveness. I know this from knowing her, but she's representing God. What does it look like? Well, it looks like Joe. And when, Joe's com when Joe comes and is playing in the band, I'm pumped. I'm pumped. You know why? Because Joe's pumped. Joe's excited, gets excited about being in the band. And, and I believe that when I see Joe, when Joe shows up, things get better. Whenever we show up, God shows up. Now, sometimes some people, ah, maybe that doesn't look like God. Well, there's a reason for that, too. Jeremy's going to get to that next week. It's about brokenness, because that, that happens too. But, but we do, we reflect his nature. And just because we have rebelled against God, God didn't give up on his plan for us to represent him. Are you with me on that? 
God didn't give up on his plan for us to be his representatives. So being made in the image of God is an assignment as much as it is. It's not giving you necessarily all the power that God says. God's given you an assignment. And that's to show up and to be him here on the earth. And, and it's an assignment that he's equipped us for. So it's not like we're perfect at this job when we arrive, but it's more like he's training us, he's equipping us for the job. And that's what it said in, in 2 Timothy. And there's two ways I want to say today. There's more ways than this, but I'm going to talk about two today. Two ways that he thoroughly equips us to complete this assignment. And what's the assignment? We represent him. What's your assignment? As a, as, yeah, represent him. That's your assignment as a person who's made in the image of God. Represent him. Represent God. And, and so how do I do that? Well, he's given us tools. Number one is what we're doing right now. He's given us teaching. He's given us instructions. This is how I want you to represent me. And, and so as we come to the scriptures, and I'm pretty pumped about Steve is reminding our class every week that Steve is on a journey. Steve Barnett, got to tell what Steve here. Steve Barnett is on a journey reading through the Bible, reading the Bible every day. We're reading, he's reading the instruction. And already, we've been at it, he's been at it a few weeks. He's read things and in the stories he knows, he's known these stories from a time he's a little kid, but because he's reading the instructions on a daily, regular way, he's learning new things. And God is teaching him new things. And why is God teaching him these new things? Because Steve represents God. And one of the ways God wanted Steve to be equipped is read the instructions. Read the instructions. If you're worried about your ability to represent God, that's what Paul told Timothy. Timothy, ah, am I going to be able to do this? Paul writes him, 2 Timothy, he says, look, the scriptures, you've known them for a long time. They're going to equip you for every good work. Wow. Equipped. He's equipping, he's giving you the tools to represent. The other thing. God has promised for us that he's going to give us his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit is working kind of like his breath in our lungs. His, his Holy Spirit is working on you to change you into the person that represents him the best. And so what it says in Galatians, that these things are going to become more your nature than your maybe worldly nature, okay? So some of these things, I want you to think of this right now, kind of ranking yourself. Now, tell me, we're not going to end up this way, but right off the bat. I'm going to read this list of fruits of the Spirit. And in your mind, give yourself a grade, 1 to 10. Not talking to somebody else. This is a, just between you and yourself right now. So here's the fruit of the Spirit. How are you? When you show up, when you represent God, love Joy, patience, how are we doing? <laughs> Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But here's the thing. God is at work in you. That's how his Holy Spirit is working in you. Now then, he wants you to play a part as well. And part of that is giving yourself to him. Giving yourself to him. When you know you're in, some of the times, you know, you, I don't know how you were on patience. But I'm a much more patient person today than I was as a younger person. I've just grown. And it's not something I did is something that God did in me. And one of the ways, though, he did it in me was he gave me patience-building exercises. Have you ever had one of those? Yeah. Patient, and he gave me some patience-building exercises when I had young children. Patience-builders. Now, some people 
they don't, the, the Holy Spirit's not at work in them when they have these experiences, and what they have is anger. So some people are get more angry than patient. You know what's the difference? Holy Spirit in you, and you saying yes to the Holy Spirit. But God is giving you the tools you need to equip you for the job He's given you. Okay, He's given you an assignment. That's re represent Him. And He's given you the tools to do that. As a child of God, I'm an image bearer. I look like my Father. That's my job. Now, not physically, but in my actions. And he gives me the responsibility and the ability to represent him. Well, that's what I was going to end with like that. But uh, yesterday, I got some other thoughts. So there's a bonus with no slide here. <laughs> bonus with no slide. So here, here's this, this idea of Imago Dei. You are made in the image of God. So is your neighbor. Your neighbor is made in the image of God also. C.S. Lewis in uh, the first book of his I ever read was an assignment in my freshman Bible class. And uh, it's mere Christianity. He ends the book with this idea. That other human beings, that we and other human beings, are made in the image of God. So much so that when we see this person, actually, this idea comes from a sermon he wrote called The Weight of Glory. And he's talking about the idea of glory. And, and when you see this other person, when we're in heaven, and we see these other people, when we see who they truly are, when we see them as made in God's image, they will be so awesome, so wonderful, we would be tempted to kneel down and worship them. Now, I want you to think about someone who is your enemy, someone you don't like, you disagree with. They don't look like you. They don't think like you. They didn't vote the way you thought everyone should vote. And you're so overwhelmed by their glory when you see them because they're made in the image of God that you feel like you should fall down and worship them. Because they're made in the image of God. Now then, what they have done with that image often, as all of us in this room, we've defaced the image. God, we have sinned. We've done that. And again, we're going to kind of get into the, that. But God is like... Okay, I'm still, even though you have rebelled against me, I'm not giving up on you because you're made in my image. And I'm not giving up on your neighbor either. There's no one, if we think of them as made in the image of God, who we will despise. We disagree, probably, often. But despise, never. Never. Because just as we are made in the image of God, so is our neighbor. And so what Jesus' advice in this, in this particular instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, would be to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to pray for the one who persecutes you. Because they're made in the image of God. God loves them. As much as he loves you. Even if they're not like you. They don't look like you. They're not from the same country you're from. They're not in the same political party you're in. They haven't had the same experiences you have. They've done awful and evil things. And God says, Jesus says, pray for them. Pray for them. They're my child as well. They're also a child of God. Pray for them. Today, we're going to sing a song about, it's an identity song. And uh, it's an identity song that we sing because we have heard these truths come from the teachings of the Bible. 
And as we sing this song, I think I want you to think also, as you are a child of God, you're also His representative, because you've made you're made in His image. You've got His DNA. You're a child of God. Let's sing.